Innovations need to be screened for feasibility. And so we need to kind of have a look at what factors will we examine to determine whether an innovation is feasible or not. And so what we're going to look at are a series of 12 screening factors for new innovations and how they fit and how they matter to the determining the feasibility of an innovation. So, and the reason we're doing this is that because innovations need to be welcomed into the marketplace if they're feasible and if they can be screened for constraints. And if they have been screened for constraints, then people will know what to expect in the marketplace. And so we're going to take a look at these 12 factors. And let's start with one, a market attractiveness factor. This is fairly fundamental. It's the sales and profit potential of a, an, an innovative idea. What revenue might it produce? What value might it produce? And how easily can it get into the marketplace and produce what we would call profitable sales? Uh, one example of this might be uh, how Apple's next generation iPad or whatever the next generation iPad or next generation iPhone product is likely to break into the market and displace sales of competitors' products. Will it really make a difference for Apple to come up with a next generation of iPad or a next generation of iPhone? And will it really be a competitive product in the marketplace? So you really have to assess that. A second factor is growth potential. So it's one thing to be able to say, yes, we've got an innovative product, but it's another thing to say, how much growth potential does it have? So the potential growth of the market need and the relative degree to which that market need is being served is an assessment that you have to make about any new innovation. So here again, we could ask, how much growth potential is there for the iPad before market demand is satisfied or some competitor provides an alternative? And I think we've already seen how quickly the marketplace has been filled with alternatives to the iPad. So uh, that's an assessment that uh, you really have to make that wouldn't stop Apple from introducing um, iPad iterations and iPad new models but it's something to consider about how much of the market you can actually get and how soon will competitors come in and uh, compete with you. This is what we would call competitor reactivity. How quickly will a, uh, a competitor come back in and emulate what you've done and that would be innovative that maybe wouldn't be able to be protected in some intellectual property way? So the ability of a dominant competitor to quickly respond is, is really being exhibited, I think, in particularly the tablet uh, world. And um, so the degree of IP protection, intellectual property protection of the innovative idea is, is one that would reduce competitor response and reactivity. So if you have some uh, intellectual property protection on your idea, uh, you're, you're less likely to be displaced by uh, a competitive reaction. And finally, the rate at which uh, competitive solutions reduce the product life cycle of new innovations. So new, you, you, in, as we've looked at the competitive uh, cycle and the, and the product life cycle, how long will that uh, mature stage last? And you have to ask yourself, if it's a short mature stage, is it really uh, something that you really want to introduce as a new innovation if you're not going to have a very long mature stage in your product life cycle? Another market attractiveness factor is the degree to which risk is distributed. So sometimes you can have more than one product in your product line that begins to spread the uh, uh, sense of diversity, spread the sense of risk, and it makes it more difficult for a competitor, any competitor's innovation to respond to what you've done. So some example of uh, this kind of broad uh, product portfolio, uh, for instance, uh, a software manufacturer like Microsoft has a range of products that can actually weather the economic turbulence in the marketplace and the competitive turbulence in the marketplace. And so even though there are a lot of other alternatives to, to what uh, Microsoft offers, they have 
gotten a, enough uh, diversity in their, uh, in their software products that they can, uh, they can fill a variety of needs without being completely threatened by, uh, by a competitor. Whereas the alternative is if you haven't distributed your risk across a number of different products in a product line, uh, you, you know, you have one, one product that's very good, uh, it's very vulnerable to risk. And so that's something uh, you need to consider. Another market attractiveness factor is uh, the potential for an industry to actually restructure itself. We talked earlier in this, uh, in this course about uh, the notion of creative destruction and how technologies and new innovations can cause creative dis uh, destruction of uh, industry sectors. And so the, the question to ask here is, to what extent does the ability of a radical new innovation cause a complete restructuring of an industry or the segment within that industry that your products might be in? And so one example might be uh, really a breakthrough battery technology that allows laptops to run uh, for 24 hours without recharging. We're not there yet, but maybe we're, we're headed there. And if somebody can come up with that kind of a breakthrough, that would be a complete restructuring of that, uh, that laptop industry and perhaps the battery laptop industry. Another market attractiveness factor is what we would call political and social constraints. Uh, these are external factors and the extent to which there are trade restrictions or tariff restrictions that create barriers for firms to move their innovative products across borders and into potential new markets. So one example is where uh, of this factor is where Microsoft was actually sued by the European Union governments for operating as a software monopoly. And so what, even though you have an innovative idea, uh, if you are operating in, in a political or social environment where that's not hospitable or receptive to your idea, then you know, you're, you're really in trouble. And so that's a factor that you need to look at. So now let's talk about some other factors, some market fit factors, how well the, uh, the idea fits with you as an enterprise and fits within the marketplace. Uh, one aspect here is what we would call capital availability. For new innovations particularly, and in startups, some limited amount of capital reduces the management flexibility that you have. So um, how well you can get into the marketplace of, depends on the capital availability that you might have access to. One example of this occurs when uh, some emerging companies outgrow their ability to cover expenses from cash, from income, and this is a very common occurrence, out of cash. Uh, companies grow very quickly, and even though they've got revenue, uh, they've expended a great deal of effort and, uh, and cost to develop that innovation, and they can't really quite recover. So you need capital to really uh, make your way into the marketplace. Um, another market fit factor is what we would call manufacturing competence. Uh, does the enterprise have the ability to create prototypes and new products and gain market entry? This is really putting things together. Sometimes you can outsource a lot of things. Sometimes you have to manage that outsourcing process Sometimes you have to bring a production uh, component inside of your organization to maintain the quality and in perhaps even the intellectual property control that you have. So this uh, manufacturing competence is uh, one example is where a cell phone manufacturer uh, could conceivably rapidly produce new innovative phone configurations and readily make them available. So this would be the ability to actually produce these things, which would give that that uh, phone company a competitive advantage uh, to take advantage of the new ideas, the new phone uh, innovations that are happening. If you didn't have a good manufacturing competence, you'd be very slow to respond and produce those new, uh, new innovative uh, phone components. Another market fit factor is handling the distribution channels that you have. The ability to gain early entry and rapid penetration of global markets. In this case, 
uh, markets beyond the region within which the enterprise might be operating. And so one example here is where Federal Express has expanded its service globally with relative ease using a very innovative operational process, a very innovative way in which people can track the delivery of uh, products and, and, uh, and shipments that are handled by Federal Express. Another market fit factor is the technical support capability that an enterprise has. And this is how well uh, the service function supports sales with the expertise to carry out incremental improvements. And so this is where you're constantly looking for innovative ways to improve your service and support. Uh, it's not just that you do the same thing, you're always looking for ways to do it better. So one example might be found in Dell Computer Service Support Function where customer data is actually used to modify the way in which they provide uh, customer support. Another market fit factor is what we would call access to critical components and critical supplies. So the reliability of critical materials and supplies and raw materials that are essential to a, a new product or a new uh, enterprise are really important because what happens if you don't have access to those things, if you don't have a reliable flow of those materials, you can't count on uh, delivering your product, you can't count on manufacturing your product. And so uh, one example of this comes uh, as a constraint where new innovations depend on offshore supply. And more and more of this is happening in our global economy, where you're depending on offshore supply of materials or components and sometimes that's not as dependable in terms of its availability or in terms of its uh, uh, reliability. And so that's a factor that you need to consider. Another market uh, fit factor is the level of management support. In any enterprise, the measure of top management support for internal initiatives, creative initiatives, entrepreneurial initiatives, innovative initiatives, is really a measure of how well you have a market fit in your enterprise. One example is where uh, Google's top managers allow their employees uh, some time during the week to explore innovative opportunities as part of their regular work responsibilities. Uh, 3M uh, uh, does this and has been doing this for some time. Uh, Procter & Gamble is experimenting with this. Many other large companies are experimenting with this. And so it's a, a market fit factor uh, that strengthens the enterprise's ability to be innovative. And so here, uh, what we're really trying to do is to offer a, a relatively straightforward matrix of how you might rank uh, innovative product potential. On the left-hand side, uh, what we have are the, the, the product itself, and on the, the bottom scale is the type of management, uh, and the, the, let's say the status of the management, how well developed the management is. And so for a very simple level of product development, le level one, it, uh, it, you know, it doesn't really matter. You can have a management status that is uh, relatively simple, so very often, you see in the 1-1 quadrant there, you're going to have startups that don't have a great deal of, of management structure, or operational structure, uh, but as you move uh, up from the 1-1 to the 2-2 or the 3-3 or even to the 4-4, as you go all the way up uh, this matrix, what you find is that uh, for the more sophisticated and the more developed your innovative idea is, the more structure, the more operational functionality you're going to have to have in your enterprise in order to manage that. And so this is just a way to kind of spotlight and uh, identify where your own idea might fit and where you see um, enterprises that are you, you consider to be innovative, where they fit. I think you'll find that most uh, uh, really hot startups are, are somewhere down in the lower lower left-hand side, and most of the ongoing companies uh, that are really very innovative are going to be on the upper right-hand side. And so here are some takeaways 
Uh, we know that all new innovations face a hurdle to gain entry into the marketplace, and so part of the important aspect of screening uh, innovations is to identify their constraints for success. And identifying constraints to success is really not only important for gaining marketplace entry, but it's important for understanding how to make improvements before you try to get into the marketplace.